I've only been dating Ty for three weeks when he asked me to go camping with him. I'm a city girl and I hate nature, but he kept pressuring me until I gave in. He said that he found this perfect place in the forest and since things were going so well between us, he really wanted to take me there. We drove to the forest outside our city and parked off the road. Then Ty took me on a two hour hike to his favorite spot. I was surprised when we got there because it was just another area of forest. There wasn't even much of a clearing. I asked him if he was sure this was the right place and he said, Absolutely. I've taken people here before. I thought that was a weird thing to say, but I quickly forgot about it. He started pitching the tent and he asked me to go collect firewood. I didn't want to be alone in the forest, but Taya assured me that there wasn't any bears or other dangerous animals in the area. It was just him and me. I walked for a bit, but I couldn't find much usable wood. It had rained recently and everything was too wet, so I kept going. Eventually, I found another clearing that had a pile of dry sticks, so I started gathering them up. It was a strange pile, as if a person had gathered up the wood and then just left it there. After I had an armful, I noticed something in the ground. That pile of sticks was covering a deep hole with something at the bottom. I was lucky I didn't fall in myself. I pulled aside a bit more of the wood and gasped. There in the pit was a dead woman. No, not just a single woman. The pit was filled with bodies half sticking out of the mud. The body on top, a blonde woman wearing high heels, stared back at me with glossy eyes. Horrified, I ran back to the campsite and told Ty what I found. He wrapped me in a hug and told me everything was going to be okay. He took out his phone and called 911, but he couldn't get a signal. He told me to wait right there while he tried to get the call to connect. I waited by the tent while Ty wandered out of view. Now that I was alone, everything seemed to crash down on me. I started to hyperventilate. But then Ty came back and helped me sit down. He said that the police told him they'd get here in about 20 minutes. We should just sit tight and wait. I didn't want to wait. I wanted to get out of there. He told me that we needed to stay here and give our statements to the police. He guided me back to the tent and told me to just rest my eyes while we waited. I did as I was told, but I also stole his phone from his pocket while he took me into the tent. There was something about his expression that I didn't trust. Since I'd met him, I'd never seen him smile like that. He looked devious and I wanted to see if he actually called 911 like he said. Once he left me alone in the tent, I pulled out his phone and looked up his call history. I was right, he'd faked the phone call to the police. But why? It didn't make any sense. I wasn't sure why I thought of this, but I decided to go through his photos to see if there was something he wasn't telling me. I saw dozens of photos of the two of us from the last few weeks, smiling and happy. Then, I got down into the photos from before we met. I saw him posing with his ex Nancy, whom I met once before. One photo showed the two of them camping just like us. She was wearing high heels for some reason. Like me, clearly he'd forced her into hiking with him. She looked very unprepared for the trip. That's when the phone dropped out of my hands. Nancy was the woman in the pit. It had to be her. That meant that Ty was a killer. He took his ex-girlfriends to this part of the woods, murdered them, and dumped their bodies in the pit. And now, he was going to do the same to me. I burst out of the tent, ready to run for my life. But Ty stopped me. He had a machete in his hand. You figured it out, huh? He said, smiling. I was going to wait till tonight, but you know, you're just too smart for your own good. Still gripping my arm, he swung the machete forward. He would have sliced right into my shoulder if I didn't twist out of the way. I need him as hard as I could, and when he let go of me, I jumped out of the tent and ran into the woods. I had no idea where I was going, but I kept running as fast as I could. It was starting to rain and the sun had already set, so I could barely see the trees around me. I didn't know I was going in the same direction as the pit until I tripped and fell directly into it. This happened so fast that I didn't even realize I'd fallen until I saw the bodies around me. They squished under me as I tried to pull myself out of the pit. It was so deep that I couldn't even reach halfway to the top. And that smell, it was the most horrible smell I'd ever experienced. It felt like I'd fallen straight into hell. I looked up and saw Ty standing at the top of the pit, looking down at me. He giggled. I'd never heard him giggle before. He still had his machete. Well. 
he said. I guess I don't need to kill you now. You'll just have to starve to death. Down there. Was there really no way out? I looked around the edges of the pit. Because of the rain, the ground was slick and muddy. He was right. There was no way that I could escape. Of course, he added. Even though you're stuck down there, you don't have to starve. After all my camping trips up here, I left you plenty of meat. He was talking about the rotting corpses. Everything was so muddy and tangled together, I couldn't tell how many bodies were down there with me. I was about to throw up, but I choked it back. As long as Ty was still there, maybe I could convince him to help me out. I knew that was insane, but it was my only hope. Why? I asked him. Why are you doing this? He didn't answer. He just shrugged and giggled. Well, I knew there was no use talking with him. Nancy's body was right under me. I guess she was his last victim. Without realizing what I was doing, I pulled off one of her high heeled shoes and started slamming the heel into the muddy wall of the pit. What are you doing? Ty asked me. I didn't know. I didn't have a plan. All I knew was that I would not allow myself to die in this pit. I kept digging and digging into the muddy wall until the whole side of the pit collapsed. The watery ground slid down on top of me, but I dug myself out and started climbing to safety. Mud and God knows what else covered my face. I couldn't see anything, but I grabbed onto anything I could and pulled myself out of the pit. As I wiped the mud out of my face, I could hear Ty behind me. When the side of the pit collapsed, I guess he fell in after me. He was at the bottom of the pit now, surrounded by all his victims, and I could hear him scream. Thanks to the rain, I was able to wipe the gunk out of my eyes. I looked back at the pit. Surely Ty was about to climb out the same way I did and then attack again, but he didn't. I didn't see him anywhere. The hole was slowly filling up with mud and rain. I could still see bodies, but I couldn't see Ty. It was like he had been pulled into the ground itself. That night, I was able to find my way back to the tent. I stole Ty's car and drove straight to the police station. They sent some officers to our spot in the woods. They found eight bodies, but Ty was not among them. I don't know what happened to him, and I hope it stays this way. That day, I couldn't really understand why Greg was being so fussy about the hike. If he didn't want to come along, he should have just stayed at the campsite. Why would he go camping with us just to stay at the tent the whole time though? Isn't that the whole point of camping? Even if it was glamping, to immerse yourself in nature as much as you can? But in hindsight, perhaps we should have listened to George and stayed put. The hike started out great. It was a bright, sunny day. Birds were chirping, and Greg was still finding things to be fussy about. One minute, it was bugs. The next, it was weeds. And then it was some non-existent leeches. We handed him the bug spray, and it managed to shut him up a little bit, though. Layla was good with a compass. She'd been here a couple of times before with family, so we trusted her when she said we should go a little bit off track. It's the long way around. We'll eventually rejoin the actual trek, but this is a more scenic route. And she was right. We came across a clearing that overlooked the valley. Breathtaking hills rolled, covered in evergreen trees as far as your eyes could see. A river ran somewhere down there. You could almost hear it. Almost feel the cold, refreshing water on your skin. Suddenly, we heard the bushes rustling behind us. None of us registered it as something malicious. I think we all must have thought it was some hiker. It's not like Layla's path was such a hidden gem. But... He came straight at us, axe swinging wildly in the air. Greg managed to dodge him in the nick of time, barely escaping with his head intact. The axe man stumbled and we ran like hell, back to the direction we came from. Layla led the way. We could hear him screaming behind us. What the hell? shouted George. Just focus on getting back to the trek. People on camp will know what to do, barked Layla, and we all silently agreed. We could still hear the men yelling behind us, screaming all sorts of obscenities. This guy's super crazy, I exclaimed. You think? said George, exasperated. We kept running and running through the woods, and eventually we did find the trek. And somehow, somehow, we ran all the way back to camp. 
We reached the campsite's entrance and saw it was full of people. Families with small kids were milling about. Everything seemed so normal, but out of breath. We looked behind our shoulders, expecting the crazy man to be chasing us. But he was gone. Huh. The crowd must have scared him off, said Greg. Yeah, but we have to tell someone about it. I'll head on over to the office and warn them, Layla reasoned before she immediately stormed off. I stood there, catching my breath, and looked at Greg. Tina, he said, heaving. I'm going back to the tent. I can't. And that was a good enough plan. I followed him back to the tent and found that I couldn't do anything but scroll through my phone. My nerves were all over the place, and eventually I managed to fall asleep. When I woke up, it was dark outside. I couldn't find my phone, and Layla was also nowhere to be found. But Greg was asleep beside me. I could tell he was in a bad shape, and I could tell he was hungry. Poor guy. He didn't even want to go on the hike in the first place. The least I could do was get us all some food. And maybe Layla took my phone. I wasn't too worried then. Maybe it was somewhere in the tent. Greg could just be sleeping over it. On my way to the cafeteria, I registered how empty the place was. I guess families with kids turned in early. But the cafeteria was also eerily empty. Hello? I called out. No one replied. There was no lunch lady behind the counter, and the buffet was empty. I guess I must have really overslept. Was it actually close to midnight? Or 2 a.m.? Where was Layla? Did they make her crash at the office? That's a bit weird. Nothing was making sense. I gave up. Going back to the tent sounded like the next logical move. Maybe Layla was back. She could have just been out to the toilet or something. But right before I left the cafeteria, at the corner of my eye, I saw something on a table. It was a Ouija board. Blanchette included. Huh? I chuckled to myself. That's funny. It's the ultimate campsite game, right? I'm sure they'll let me borrow this. Could be a great way to take our minds off of what happened that afternoon. As predicted, Greg was fussy about it. Layla was still not around, but, you know, I wasn't really worried about her. She's probably somewhere hooking up with some guy. Some hot dad looking for a summer fling. Wouldn't be the first time that that's happened. I managed to wrangle Greg into it, and there we were, sat in front of each other, one finger each on the planchette. Wait, what are we supposed to do? How do we start this thing? Asked Greg. I guess we just have to call upon the spirits and talk to them? Suddenly, the planchette moved. Greg's eyes went wide. Tina, Tina, tell me you're doing that, he screamed. I couldn't control my excitement. I must have been grinning ear to ear when I told Greg it wasn't me. He looked scared, but began focusing on the board as I did. It was moving from letter to letter. G. R. E. Oh hell no! Is it spelling my name? G. Greg! I shouted. That's right, that's Greg. I'm Tina. Nice to meet you. Who are we talking to? Planchette kept moving. W. H. O. Who? W. A. Was, said Greg, reading the planchette. The. Axeman, I said, finishing the sentence. The Axeman? Greg asked. From earlier today? We don't know who he was. He just came at us. Did he kill you? Is that why you want to know? The planchette began moving on its own again. This time, it spelled out. N. O. I read it out loud. No. I. M. L. A. Y. No, I'm Layla. You died, whispered Greg as you read the board. We sat there in silence, trying to process the information. That's why the whole camp was empty and why it was so dark outside. We must have died this afternoon. The X-Men got to us after all. Somehow, Layla survived and she was the one contacting us with a Ouija board, not the other way around. 
Greg looked up at me with tears in his eyes. I felt the same way. Greg, we don't know who he was, right? No, we should tell her that and I guess let them handle it? Yes, it's the most logical thing to do next. I scoffed. We were dead and somehow living in the afterlife. Two ghosts, still trying to figure out what was the next logical thing to do. It was my first time camping out in the woods. I'd been to a couple of those big camping and glamping sites before, which were usually equipped with facilities and had staff on hand for emergencies. But this time, we would be out in the boonies. Just us, and our tents, and the natural wilderness. I'd be lying if I said I wasn't nervous about the trip. I wasn't the biggest fan of the outdoors. And the thought of having no access to hot water or public conveniences or any of my usual home comforts wasn't the most appealing. But my brother really wanted to go. And I was the one he had asked. I'd always found it difficult to say no to my brother. He was younger than me by a couple of years and I had a soft spot for his puppy eyes, so of course I had agreed. We went on a weekday, since we both had the day off work and it meant that the roads were quieter for travel. We packed everything up into the trunk of my car and made the two-hour trip to the forest where we had decided to set up camp. Are you nervous? I asked as we pulled into the small gravel car park at the edge of the trees. Eh, not really, Jake said with that casual shrug of his. Why are you? I bit my lip. I didn't want to seem like an uncool older brother, but I didn't want to lie to him either about my reservations. A little. I've never gone camping out in the wild before, I said. Jake rolled his eyes. I would hardly call it the wild, he said, unclipping his seatbelt and pushing the door open. We'll be fine. We have radios and plenty of emergency supplies. I nodded, stepping out onto the gravel and taking a deep breath of the fresh pine-scented air. <sighs> You're right. I'm sure it'll be fine. We hauled our gear out of the trunk, two heavy backpacks and a shoulder bag, and I locked the car behind me before we set off into the forest. It was immediately darker beneath the trees, despite it still being a little before midday. The air was humid, and I swatted bugs and twigs out of my face with a disgruntled sigh. <laughs> You're going to have to get used to the bugs, Jake said with a chuckle. I brought bug spray if you get desperate. You could have told me that before we started walking. Jake only grinned, showing no remorse whatsoever. There were places in the forest that were marked as appropriate campsites and Jake had chosen one in an open clearing close to a river. I could hear it trickling through the undergrowth when we reached the site and started setting up. It took us just under an hour to get the tent set up and unpack all of our supplies. By the time we had finished, I had worked up a sweat and my forehead was slick with perspiration. I wiped it away and took a long swig from my flask of water. Now that that's out of the way, I'm going to explore, Jake said looking as though he was about to rush off through the trees. Hey, 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 not so fast, I said, grabbing him by his elbow. We're not separating for a moment that we're out here. He pouted. <sighs> Seriously? Even when I need to take a leak? I rolled my eyes. You're my baby bro. I'm not letting anything happen to you while we're here. He shrugged me off. I'm not a baby anymore, Alex, he said gruffly. Fine, let's go together. You'll remember how to find the campsite? Jake nodded, taking out his compass. Out here in the forest, with limited signal, we had to go old school with our equipment. No fancy GPS out here. All right then, let's go. When we come back, I'll get started on dinner. We left the campsite in the clearing and headed deeper into the forest, following a northeast trajectory according to Jake's compass. The further we went, the thicker the trees became, pressing close together to create a dense, almost impassable thicket. A clump of sharp twigs snagged me back and tore a hole through the material of my shirt. I cursed out loud, trying to untangle the branches from my clothes. I finally pulled free and glanced up. Jake was gone. Panic burned through my chest like a raging fire, and I scanned the trees ahead of me for any sign of my brother. Jake? Jake, where did you go? When he didn't answer me, my panic doubled and I dashed forward through the trees, not caring when branches scratched and tore at my skin. Jake! 
This was exactly what I had been afraid of. The forest was large and it was far too easy to get lost. The more I thrashed and stumbled through the trees, the more disoriented I grew. The sky barely visible through the canopy, giving me no clue as to which direction I was headed. It was starting to get dark as well. The shadows were growing thicker around me, making it harder to see. Jake! Where- My voice died in my throat when I glimpsed a figure standing behind the trees ahead of me. Only part of their silhouette was visible, like an ink blot on a canvas. Jake! Hey, Jake! I stumbled forward, reaching out to him, when something stopped me. A hand on my shoulder. I almost screamed, spinning round. Jake was standing behind me, a concerned look on his face. Whoa, Alex, I'm right here. What's wrong? My heart thundered in my chest as I caught my breath. <sighs> oh, I thought I'd lost you, I said, my voice still a little shaky. Then I frowned. If Jake was here, then who had I seen standing behind the trees just now? With a start, I turned to where I'd seen the shadow. The trees were empty. There was nobody there. Had I simply imagined it? Alex, is something wrong? I swallowed hard, shaking my head. No, nothing's wrong. It's starting to get dark now. We should head back to the campsite. Jake nodded. I cast one last glance at the trees behind me before following him. I was relieved when we reached the campsite again and immediately got to work starting a small fire. Now, the smoke and flames would at least keep some of the bugs away. As we ate dinner around the fire, I couldn't help but think about the strange shadow I had seen standing between the trees. The more I thought about it, the less likely it seemed that I had merely imagined it. Did that mean we weren't alone out here? It wasn't weird for other hikers or campers to be out, but why hadn't they said anything? Are you sure you're okay, Alex? You've been distracted since we got out. I didn't want to scare my brother, so I decided not to tell him what I'd seen. Yeah, just a little tired. Yeah, me too, he said, stretching out his arms. Once the fire dies out, I think I'm going to head to sleep. Jake retired first, heading into the tent after bidding me goodnight. Despite my trepidation, I stayed out a little longer, listening to the birds and bugs scuttling through the undergrowth. I was about to follow my brother when, in the dying light of the fire, I thought I glimpsed something moving through the trees on my left. I hastily scrambled for my flashlight and clicked it on, directing the beam into the darkness. Nothing. Maybe I was being paranoid, but the strange chill on my neck told me that maybe I wasn't. Maybe there really was someone out there. I waited for another ten minutes, shining my light through the trees until the fire died out completely and it was time for me to get some sleep. I ducked into the tent I was sharing with Jake and zipped it closed. After a moment, I decided to tie the zipper to the strap of one of our packs, so that if anyone tried to open it from the outside, it would be more difficult and make more noise. Then I crawled into my sleeping bag beside my snoring brother and fell asleep. I awoke the next morning, to Jake violently shaking my shoulder. I gave a start, blinking the grogginess out of my eyes as I asked him what was wrong. You need to come and see this, he gasped, fear twisting his face. The panic in his voice was enough to sober me up, and I scrambled after him out of the tent into the clearing. Sprawled out, right in the middle of our campsite, where the cold remains of the fire lay, was a dead crow. It had been badly mutilated, its wings torn and its body slashed open. Blood soaked the ground around it. And someone had smeared blood on the outside of our tent too, in swaths of long fingerprints that almost looked too big to be human. Oh my god, I whispered, my mind going back to the shadowy figure I had seen standing between the trees. We hadn't been alone last night after all. I turned to Jake, my mouth going dry. I think it's time we get out of here, I said. This time, Jake didn't argue.
It was windy outside the night it happened. Ryan, my boyfriend, was out for yet another party, and I was once again left alone at home watching the rain slash against the windows. Unlike Ryan, I was more of an introvert and didn't enjoy much socializing, hence most of the times I preferred to stay home. I know I shouldn't have, but I was on my phone for pretty much the entire night. I'd been afraid for the past couple of days that Ryan was cheating on me with this girl he'd met at work, but I refused to believe it considering we'd been dating for almost five years now. Surely he wouldn't choose to cheat knowing our history, as violent as it may have been. For the hundredth time, I decided to check my phone. The bright flash of a notification beamed outwards from it, and I was now staring at a message I had just received from Ryan's friend, Mike. The text audibly pierced into me as my lip trembled in a furious temper. Hi Amy, hope you're having a lovely night, but I wanted to let you know that I think Ryan's cheating. Yeah, so I've been seeing him walk around with this brunette all night, hand around her waist and everything. And hey, if you come down, please don't tell him I told you. I'm still his friend, but it just didn't seem fair to you that you didn't know. See you soon, Amy. My eyelids fluttered in disbelief. How could he? I screamed aloud. Am I not enough for him? How long has this been going on? How dare he keep this from me? I had reached a peak in my animosity, and I was ready to rip his throat out then and there, if only the option was available to me. Instead, I dashed out of the house, slamming the door shut behind me, and began sprinting down the stairwell and out of the apartment block. Ryan had told me that the party was being held at a friend's place a couple of blocks down the road. It wasn't a very accurate location, but it was enough to point me in the right direction at the very least. Once I had reached the end of my block, it had suddenly occurred to me that my socks were drenched in the rainwater, and the gravel below had torn up the soles. The pain was unbearable, but I prioritized my emotions first. And then a car pulled up beside me. Hey, are you Ryan's girlfriend? The voice came from the driver. Not for long. Why? I said. He unlocked the car door. Ah, perfect. I was going to drop a load of food off at the party he's at now. A guy called Mike put in the instructions for me to pick up his friend Ryan's girlfriend on the way there if I saw her. I was momentarily alarmed that he had found me so easily, but the story matched up with what Mike had told me, so I carefully clampered inside the back. It was filled with tons of delivery bags, and the smell was utterly fantastical. I had forgotten to eat dinner that night, so I was hoping to maybe have some once we got there. That would give me all the energy I needed to go and confront that piece of shit trotting around with bimbo. Oh my god, are you in socks? He must have noticed them when I got in. Yeah, I just found out Ryan's been cheating. I completely forgot to put shoes on when I rushed out. He bore an expression of artificial shock. Oh god, I'm so sorry. You still want to go there? I stared at him intently and growled, yes. His skin tightened, and he looked back towards the road ahead. You know, Ryan and I have been together for five years now. And then he goes and throws it all away for some random girl? It's ridiculous! The driver nodded, but said nothing. He merely acknowledged it. I sat back, feeling irritated that he couldn't see how revolting Ryan was for doing such a thing, until I realized we had arrived at the place. We're here. You get out, I've got to take care of some more deliveries first. Considering he had said he was delivering here, it made no sense why he would suddenly go and deliver somewhere else first. But that didn't matter now. I was here, and Ryan would pay for his sin. She's here, the driver announced loudly as I stepped out of the car. I turned back as if to smack him for alerting people of my presence. I wanted to catch Ryan red-handed. The door of the house was open. I assumed that Mike must have left it open for me. As I tiptoed inside the house, I saw Mike sitting calmly on the sofa. Oh great, here you are. Where's Ryan? I asked him. Mike smiled and pointed towards the other direction, and in walked Ryan with the brunette. Amy, what are you doing here? He too had a smile on his face. This left me confused as well as disgusted. How could I love him, this man who had no shame even after being caught? 
I came to talk to you. Mike told me that you're cheating on me with this bimbo. Ryan's face turned red with anger. That's a lie, he shouted. Is it? Because it sure looks like you're having a good time with her, I said. Hey, I'm Angelica. Yes, the bimbo. That's what Amy called me. And no, that's not the reason I slapped the shit out of her. <laughs> you see, we're a team. Me, Mike, and Ryan. We like you. Yes, the hopeless romantic inside you. We spot it and bring it out. Don't take us wrong. We treat you like prince and princess. I mean, I can speak for myself. If you date me, I will do whatever you tell me to. Yeah, you heard that right. As for Mike and Ryan, they'll take you to the best of the places and shower you with gifts. You like to spoil them, Mike, don't you? But then, once we're done with you, we won't dump you the traditional way. You know, life is short, and even breakups must be exciting. Something that gives adrenaline rush. We will torture you, cut you, tear you apart, slowly, very, very slowly. And make sure you're awake to witness all this. After all, you are the sole audience. Once we're done, we move. There's so much love to give and so little time. But you don't worry. Love is soon going to knock on your door. <laughs>